going to be doing here is spending about an hour discussing um, an overview of obviously blood flow restriction as, it, as it's regarding to rehabilitation science. Um, my background specifically, uh, I've been in the world of rehab or physical therapy now for about 11 years, um, going on 12. It's been a long time. Um, my background originally started as uh, an exercise physiologist. Um, coming out of my undergraduate and getting to conduct um, some really interesting um, research at the time, um, focusing a lot on the aging community, uh, focusing on things like sarcopenia uh, and just overall muscle wasting uh, based diseases. Um, and that led me really to um, garner a lot of interest into the field of physical therapy on the side, more of the biology, you know, um, and the physiology. Like what, what is happening when we um, face an injury, what is happening as we all get older. Um, these are things that obviously are very close uh, to my own personal life um, and the lives of my family. So I felt it, um, you know, a higher calling to, to really, you know, dig deep into this field to understand it better. And that led for me to uh, completing a doctorate in physical therapy um, in 2014. Um, at that time, I was an assistant uh, uh, Perform, human Performance Lab Director over at Florida International University um, and led many different studies on campus um, that focus all the way from pediatrics in um, uh, understanding cases of cerebral palsy um, to uh, more specific um, uh, biomechanical studies on drop landing, um, a couple studies with some shoe manufacturers, um, various different studies looking at ergonomics uh, for lifting, uh, training nursing staff, and in general, a mix of different um, studies using different overall tools. Um, from there, I moved to uh, Tennessee, where I reside today and practice. And um, here I've been a physical therapist in various different settings. I've worked in all settings in PT except home health. So I've done inpatient, I've done um, acute care, I've done uh, assisted living. I've done long-term care, uh, obviously outpatient physical therapy where I've predominantly held a majority of my practice time um, and have held um, my own business as a private practice owner for a period of time as well. Uh, I currently also um, assist um, in uh, some research studies that are done at a local university here, Belmont University, um, where we do uh, BFR, so blood flow restriction based um, studies. We've done two of them thus far. Um, hopes are we will be restarting once, um, you know, obviously certain COVID restrictions continue to change. And as we go forward with vaccinations, hopefully that will come more online. But I've also taught within undergraduate universities here um, within the sports medicine uh, background. Uh, currently, I'm a PhD candidate uh, in health and human performance, and I've sought to do that as a means of just extending the bridge of knowledge um, to myself, not just in the realm of blood flow restriction, because Although it is a very valuable tool, it is a tool. So understanding how to apply it, which is what we're going to be doing today, is going to be an important aspect if you are anywhere within the field of rehabilitation. So whether you are a physician that's referring patients for, for uh, blood flow restriction or obviously a clinician uh, applying it to a patient, um, this knowledge is very vital and important for you to understand. And today we're just going to be scratching the surface of that. Uh, but my, my main focus with my PhD is to peer further into the understanding of, uh, of pain science. Um, why, why is it that we as humans have the ability to modulate pain based on our, our experiences that we've gone through? Um, and how can the role of exercise, you know, um, improve and restore our nervous system to a place where we obviously can have a better, higher quality of, uh, of life? So the objectives for this morning are going to be obviously to give a brief history of blood flow restriction training. Uh, we're going to focus on the mechanisms involved with blood flow restriction training as best as we can understand them now. There are still many areas that we need to explore further, but we will go into some detail today. Afterwards, we're going to discuss uh, some patient populations and some recommendations uh, within the literature from other experts that are looking at ways that we can implement blood flow restriction as a uh, kind of step strategy, moving from post-operative or post-injury all the way to discharge. Um, we'll then be covering some contraindications and precautions. Obviously, um, the field of tourniquet research is not new, um, and it does predate um, the field of application of a tourniquet with exercise that we obviously call blood flow restriction training. 
but we'll still go into some of those details because they're important as you proceed forward with wanting further education and thinking of the patient populations that you're already working with. Uh, and then lastly, we're going to go into just some of the, uh, like, how can blood flow restriction be seen in the clinical setting more specifically? So the history of blood flow restriction as a means of exercise really kind of starts off in the field of uh, just looking at hypoxia. Um, some early research done in the 90s um, was more specifically wanting to understand, you know, is, is this high altitude exercise, is this beneficial to people? You know, we see athletes um, that uh, train in high altitude sometimes gain some benefits, but we wanted to understand it further. So um, some researchers at the time had established that, you know, training in a hypoxic environment uh, may have improvements in aerobic performance, and it may be based on changes with erythropoic, um, basically red blood cell uh, formation um, and, and health of the red blood cells, which can improve maximum oxygen um, intake or VO2. But this was met with some, um, some controversy at the time where other studies went ahead and looked at to say, hey, well, this chronic exposure to hypoxia uh, may actually have some reductions in benefit to, to you know, overall people um, by view of seeing them having reduced um, muscle size measured by cross-sectional area with MRI. And this was kind of a, a, an important point to make because for years, um, when the conversation of blood flow restriction started here in the United States, there was a lot of pushback because people were looking at, you know, various studies that said, hey, but hypoxia doesn't seem to be healthy for people to exercise. And it would make more sense for people to have more oxygen because oxygen is, you know, this vital, um, you know, currency of the human body and having more of it seems to be beneficial. Um, obviously, there was even studies um, at that time looking at um, uh, post-surgical uh, base candidates uh, or, or patients who, upon deflation of the tourniquet for surgery, did experience increased reactions to things like reactive um, uh, oxygen species um, or essentially having further increased inflammation. So there was a lot of controversy kind of heading into the world of, of blood flow restriction training that rightly so needed more research to help and explore really, you know, the safety um, and, and obviously the benefits, you know, to doing it. Um, so this takes us now into more of the specific history of blood flow restriction itself. We want to understand that on this call, we're all kind of accepting implicitly that tourniquets are safe to use. They're used on a daily basis um, in surgery um, uh, with patients um, coming out of surgery, not having things like tissue necrosis, um, not having things like uh, nerve demyelination, obviously specifically talking about duration of the surgery. But we want to understand that tourniquets are quite safe. So where the history of tourniquet research really predates anything related to blood flow restriction, um, we want to think of blood flow restriction as a deviating line away from that, you know, branching from it and then growing into obviously how we understand it today. So the real history of it starts with... Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Sato in uh, the 1960s, who following um, some just independent experiences with uh, tissue hypoxia and then it further experiencing things like cell swelling or just the overall pump, um, began to further want to explore um, this notion. Um, he was a child of two physicians and had a lot of access to good medical information. And this helped him to, you know, really kind of uh, be a guinea pig, so to speak, for all of us, um, starting off with inner tubes and then from there, you know, progressing into the invention of the Katsu band system um, and then having really kind of a landmark uh, research paper that he did with um, a cardiologist uh, in Japan to uh, demonstrate that the use of, of these tourniquet-like devices um, in his own personal experience was something that could be more broad and could be more generalized. And what they started to realize was that you know, very little weight was required to actually see any sort of significant change. And this is important in the conversation of rehabilitation, because obviously many patients cannot be undergoing, you know, higher intensity exercises just due to risk um, and or contraindications post-injury or post-surgery, of which Dr. Sato himself actually did have um, a lower limb fracture, um, which at the time he, uh, against his doctor's wishes, self-treated himself with a tourniquet system uh, of his own invention, um, and on his own uh, radiographs demonstrated increased um, uh, bone remodeling. So decreased uh, healing time was needed. 
And again, that garnered a lot of attention at the time. So what those uh, what the early studies showed us was that intensities as low as 30 and 50% of a one repetition max, which is quite low and, and does not generally represent any sort of real um, stimulus for uh, changes in muscle strength. Uh, it can with muscle size, but there's some caveats to it. And, and those are basically that the exercises are taken to near failure. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but uh, these overall um, intensity ranges do not generally increase any sort of muscle strength. But what they saw in these groups was that there was increased electrophysiological activity in the muscle by about 40%. Which demonstrated to them that there was an improvement in motor unit recruitment that was potentially happening. Um, they did see significant increases in cross sectional area, which meant that the muscles were undergoing some sort of hypertrophy. And at the time, there had not been yet a full uh, understanding of all of the um, mechanosensitive aspects of muscle. Um, so this just really started to kind of garner more attention to individuals in the field of muscle physiology and exercise physiology. Uh, just based on the fact that these low intensity uh, time frames or intensity ranges were able to demonstrate change. This takes us now to around you know, 2010, 2011, leading to a publication in 2012 by Jeremy Vonnecke uh, from uh, Old Miss University here in the United States, where he began questioning really the findings of what was happening. And what he started to understand was that you know, individuals that were undergoing blood flow restriction with the weights being so low, it did not fit any of the uh, previous understanding of how intensity um, and, 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 you know, um, me mechanical tension placed on muscle could induce any sort of change. So he proposed potential hypothesis that maybe there were some metabolic aspects happening, or maybe there was a subset of some mechanical aspect occurring, but much deeper, much all the way down into the actual myocyte itself, into the muscle cell itself, through the accumulation of, of water or plasma into the cell, which is known as cell swelling. The thoughts were that potentially maybe this might be stimulating um, skeletal muscle hypertrophy by targeting at the time, what is understood as mammalian target of rapamycin, which is a protein uh, sensing pathway that can look at either an abundance of nutrition or an abundance of overall mechanical stimulation because it is a mechanical sensitive um, tissue. Um, but there were still unknown mechanisms at the time of this publication and that really garnered um, a, a continued flow of research to be done. Um, fast forward uh, till around 2018, 2019, we've now had many years of follow-up um, case studies that were being done um, in actual um, clinical um, uh, cases. So these were individuals that were um, originally uh, in, in what we would call limb salvage. Um, and these were individuals that were within our military uh, that had been um, referred to what's known as the Center for the Intrepid, uh, which at the time, the main director, Johnny Owens, uh, if, if anybody here on the call is from the United States, you, you've heard of him a lot, especially if you are a physical therapist here in the United States. Because he's really, I would say, probably the um, you know uh, the, the father, so to speak, of blood flow restriction within the United States, and really helping to provide it uh, a footing to have uh, more attention brought to it, a more serious attention brought to it, um, because he was working with uh, some of the most at-risk individuals for limb amputation, uh, which meant that these individuals um, had you know undergone um, significant limb surgery following. Um, you know, uh, a high intensity based trauma, which could have been experienced on the battlefield for a number of different types of reasons. But what they demonstrated was that with the application of, uh, you know, specific types of tourniquets and, and, and really he helped to introduce a lot of the, the technological foundations for why even Matta has designed, you know, their unit to be the way that it is with their own proprietary software in there. But this starts our understanding of why there does need to be guidelines as we approach this going forward, because the results um, that were observed in these groups was that they were able to have reduced atrophy, they were able to increase muscle size. So again, noticing that there was increases in muscle hypertrophy, they were able to increase in strength. Uh, they were able to, uh, many of them avoid having uh, limb amputation. And for the ones that did, it provided them a path forward um, for a faster um, acceptance to their uh, prosthetic 
that they would be using. And as well, it opened up many doors for the thousands, tens of thousands, really, of, of just orthopedic-based injuries that are experienced uh, from active duty um, military members um, that garnered a lot of attention within the um, area of professional sports because many of the surgeons that were in the nearby uh, regions of Texas um, saw that, you know, if, if he's getting, you know, these benefits with these individuals, what can we maybe get with, you know, these ACL patients? What can we maybe get with these um, Achilles tears, these high hamstring strains? And really from there, um, with a lot of understanding of the physiology, the main body of physicians really introduced it um, into their professional practices. And as of 2018, um, it became now part of the American Physical Therapy Association's scope of practice. So now all licensed physical therapists um, here in the United States can um, be trained in blood flow restriction um, and gain uh, certification and licensure to be able to practice it safely within their settings, obviously bearing in mind using correct tools and so forth. So um, in this paper that was published in 2019, it provides an excellent overview of the guidelines specific to you know, what cuff pressures are the safest ones that they've seen to use. Um, and, and really what we've established at that point is they are individual pressures. Um, and that's why we need to have devices that can um, not only just measure overall um, pressures in the limb, but to garner additional safety can monitor those pressures and maintain them. Um, but guidelines as well as to cuff width, cuff material, and then furthermore from there, um, what are the appropriate loads? You know, are there loads that are too low to not see any beneficial change um, in maybe strength, but might lower loads in some particular cases um, prove to be beneficial for individuals that really cannot undergo any sort of exercise at all to at least reduce the amount of muscle atrophy that, they've, uh, that they're experiencing. From there, obviously the volume of exercise, the rest periods that are used, the duration of the application of being underneath the tourniquet, and obviously the frequency, how often can we be applying it, uh, were really built out of these guidelines. And we'll be covering more from this paper um, as we go through the actual presentation. So um, from there, we can now go into the mechanisms that are understood. Because uh, at this point, being part of our scope of practice, we've established that it is safe to apply in, in, in clinical case populations. Um, and obviously there is a large amount of um, data taken from healthy subjects that really you know, kind of carved out that path moving forward. So let's kind of give a, a brief overview of you know, a definition of what is blood flow restriction taken from the stance of obviously a medical provider who understands some of this language. So the application of a pneumatic cuff placed on either the upper extremities or lower extremities that is filled with air to a percentage of the individual's systolic blood pressure or what is known as limb occlusion pressure used with or without low intensity exercise, uh, which obviously is anywhere, you know, potentially less than 40% of a one repetition max, uh, to intermittently restrict arterial blood flow into the limb while occluding venous blood flow away from the limb. Uh, so what's important to understand here is that you know, the application of a tourniquet with exercise is going to be different than the application of a tourniquet for the use of surgery and or uh, a, a life or limb saving um, scenario. Um, so these tourniquets, uh, by and large, um, are going to solely be used uh, for short duration periods of time, anywhere less than about 20 minutes at a time, um, which underneath most um, sur uh, surgical suites are going to be um, really kind of, um, you know, just starting to scratch the surface of what most patients will be experiencing with tourniquet use while in surgery. And obviously, you know, they're, they're not experiencing these large um, um, high risk outcomes because of it. Um, the application of the tourniquets, as you see um, in image A, are really done um, in order to help and reduce um, venous outflow. And the reason why this is, is we've understood that when muscles contract, they do release byproducts. And these byproducts um, do have a metabolic um, way of, of, of addressing information to the nervous system uh, via specific nerves, which are called metaboreceptors. Um, and these help to augment and modulate uh, perception of pain. They help to augment and modulate um, cardiovascular um, uh, response. Um, and they also augment um, some of the endothelial responses from the internal uh, 
um, um, artery itself, uh, which play a role in just with general exercise, but obviously with the tourniquet providing means of programming more of that microenvironment within the tissue to obviously see benefits. Um, in image B, although you do see four tourniquets on that individual as they're represented, the typical application of blood flow restriction is only done with either um, an individual upper extremity, bilateral upper extremity, and um, uh, let, let's say separately then um, an individual lower extremity or bilateral low, lower extremity. Um, uh, to date, to my knowledge, studies using all four limbs uh, have not been undergone, and it's just simply due to safety um, regarding um, the effects that it can have on the cardiovascular system, uh, just due to overall restrictions in stroke volume. Now, some of the primary mechanisms that we've understood uh, to be why we see some improvements in muscle size and maybe potentially muscle strength have to do first with mechanical tension. So we've well established within the literature that muscles have an ability to generate large amounts of force and they have also force sensing um, uh, uh, tissue types within them. Uh, some of which we understand that obviously mTOR um, uh, can have a, uh, a, a mechanical sensitive nature to it as well as a nutrition sensitive nature to it. Um, uh, titan or Titan, uh, which is a, uh, a, a contractile or, or let's say an assisting um, contractile uh, muscle tissue um, does also have um, high levels of uh, mechanosensitive nature to it. Other integrins and focal adhesions within the muscle, which are known as costomeres, one of them being filament C bag three, which is, again, if these things seem unfamiliar with you, um, I, I very much invite you uh, to, be, to participate in future uh, presentations where we will go more into detail with this. But mechanical tension and, and stretch have been well established within the literature um, for now um, decades to understand it having an ability to generate uh, changes within uh, the muscle um, at, at the level of gene expression, um, and then obviously altering morphology of the muscle itself. Um, we've understood also that metabolic stress plays a primary factor um, uh, as well, a primary mechanism. Um, we do know that the muscle um, does have, again, particular uh, metabolic receptors that are very sensitive to inorganic phosphate and as well to the intramuscular pH changes that occur with exercise. And this can have a, a subsequent effect at changing and altering recruitment patterns. So obviously we know that human beings are structured in a way that muscles undergo um, various different levels of uh, recruitment patterns. Uh, this has been well established within the literature um, to have an orderly fashion under normal circumstances, which means that when we begin to undergo human movement, um, muscles have a level of electrical resistance to them. So muscle fibers that have low electrical resistance are the ones that first initiate contraction. And we would call these our postural based muscle fibers. These muscle fibers have a high affinity to oxygen. Uh, they're also largely, um, uh, uh, let's say they have a, a high resistance to injury and a high resistance to fatigue. And um, the orderly nature of the contraction of the chain of motor units and additional muscle fibers is largely hindering on obviously a few things. One of them being oxygen. Uh, the other ones can be um, additional energy within the muscle itself. And one can undergo a good understanding of the application of a tourniquet does have an ability to obviously reduce oxygen intake into the muscle by restricting the arterial system. And what happens next is obviously changes within these metaboreceptors, communicating this information to the central nervous system uh, via these, uh, what are called group three and group four afferents. These are our metaboreceptors. And these can have an inhibitory effect on the alpha motor neuron for some of these, again, low threshold, oxygen dependent, um, low resistance uh, motor units and muscle fibers. And as a subsequent effect, the orderly nature of contraction can allow us to then um, uh, apply more um, uh, increased electrical frequency via increased action potentials into the, uh, into the muscle. And what that means is that we can now undergo alterations within uh, voltage changes to allow us to contract higher uh, levels of motor units, which means we can uh, recruit higher levels of uh, high threshold muscle fibers. And these are what we call our type two muscle fibers. Um, and this has been well established within the literature that this is 
this is occurring. And this may be what is up, uh, helping us to understand that although the intensities are low, the tension within the muscle itself is quite high because of this alteration within um, obviously oxygen and then the further um, uh, increase in local metabolites that in normal circumstances and free flow with exercise um, occur as well. So blood flow restriction really to this point is appearing to have you know, not a huge difference within the ability to recruit muscle aside from the intensities needed and also the time duration needed to do so. Um, in one of the studies uh, that we've conducted at Belmont University, we saw you know, nearly a 40% decrease in the amount of uh, repetitions really needed to substantially see an increase um, in, in overall changes in strength and muscle size. So it's important to note that you know, these benefits that we see um, are in parallel uh, with general strength training, um, but again, have a, a slight stepping off point because of the intensity uh, needed with it. Secondary me mechanisms have further been established, um, and these are the ones that are more metabolic in nature. Um, but we do know that you know, when muscles undergo stress, they do experience some damage. You will uh, see within the literature that blood flow restriction does initially have um, a, a, a low profile for muscle damage, uh, really no different than what, what would be seen with low intensity training um, in individuals that are untrained. Um, but even with individuals that are trained, there can be some um, early experiences of some low levels of muscle damage. And as the muscles obviously are undergoing increased um, uh, stretching from the actual soft swelling, and obviously from promoting you know, higher levels of motor unit recruitment or muscle fiber um, uh, recruitment. So when we do see muscle damage, there has been now understanding that there are increases um, post BFR uh, with insulin-like growth factor. And, and there, there's different types of, of, of IGF. Um, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But um, IGF-1 specifically, we understand does regulate protein synthesis. And it does so via a few different pathways um, which have been well established in the literature to then further undergo um, activation again of this mTOR pathway, which does again have an ability to change and alter um, uh, muscle gene expression and morphology. We do know that the systemic and localized hormone effect following exercise um, with things like growth hormone um, are noted, but they are also noted and proposed with blood flow restriction uh, because we do see increases in things like collagen um, um, uptake, um, and, and that is only possible due to growth hormone. There are um, obviously increases in what we call IGF-1-EA, which is a systemic form of IGF, uh, which is otherwise known as uh, mechanical growth factor or MGF, and these do um, are, are proposed and have shown to have increases when um, performing or let's say post uh, blood flow restriction. Obviously, the pump itself is understood. Some people may say that it is a primary mechanism. Some people may say it's a secondary mechanism. But we do know, again, this hydrated mediated cell swelling does occur with blood flow restriction, and it is temporary. Um, it, it, it's present within you know, uh, a short period of time following, and that may be individual uh, you know, across various different um, uh, male versus female. Um, but it, does, it is only intermittent, and it does subside. So um, here is here and lay why some of the reasons why we don't even have, you know, current to date um, uh, clinical practice um, codes for blood flow restriction, because we've, we really need to establish, you know, all of the outcomes present so that we know if we are going to be billing for this as physical therapists here in the United States, you know, what are the initial findings and what are the post findings? Because a lot of um, uh, clinical tools that we use for um, documenting uh, pre and post um, interventions um, need to have this information present. So uh, moving on, we do know, yes, there are increases in reactive oxygen species um, post BFR, and that's seen just across the board and just general tourniquet-based research. Um, and we understand that it, it may potentially have a beneficial effect um, within muscle just based off of previous studies that have shown potential benefit to smooth muscle and cardiac muscle as well. Um, obviously, we do understand that there are increases in nitric oxide that are expressed from the endothelium itself, and that nitric oxide may provide a background for stimulating satellite cell activation and proliferation, which is seen um, within the literature with blood flow restriction. Uh, this helps to understand why we do see some potential benefits to 
uh, muscle hypertrophy that can be sustained even after periods of uh, detraining that are done in various different studies with blood flow restriction, uh, specifically within the elderly. Okay, um, heat shock proteins as well have been understood to increase, uh, more specifically uh, HSP72, which is known uh, to have some benefits for muscle protein synthesis. All right, some other secondary mechanisms are more related to the catabolic and anabolic pathways known as the autocrine or paracrine uh, systems. And uh, the literature does propose that we are seeing some changes within these systems. Uh, and this may be why we're seeing increased satellite cell activation and proliferation and fusion uh, post-training. Um, but obviously further research does need to be conducted. So uh, potential patient populations that benefit from blood flow restriction um, there has been a number of different reviews that have been done, particularly in this area. Um, this particular study done by Hughes et um, al. in 2017 um, looked at comparing blood flow restriction uh, to low load and then comparing blood flow restriction uh, to high load training. And what they saw was that when the approach of taking blood flow restriction um, into a low load scenario, which would obviously be within a clinical setting. So this was looking at patients that had uh, knee OA, uh, various different ligament injuries, uh, sporadic inclusion, body myositis, or in general, just overall older adults, again, susceptible to sarcopenia or age-related muscle losses. Um, uh, the, the, the literature resoundingly shows that it is in favor that individuals do undergo the use of blood flow restriction to improve and augment um, overall uh, physical function, strength, um, and muscle size. And obviously there are some benefits uh, to cardiovascular function. But again, it's important that we understand that blood flow restriction again is just a tool because when we stack it up against um, high intensity training, then very much so uh, high intensity training is favored to be performed over blood flow restriction. And I think right here is where we find our channel, you know, where we see light intensity training on one end, high intensity training on the other, and BFR in the middle, and it really being a bridge towards high intensity training if possible, but also being a bridge away from it when necessary following an injury or following post-surgery. Now, some uh, proposed um, aspects that should be taken um, uh, into more of a notion of why, how should we approach this with these patient populations? You know, it's important that we understand that in many cases, some patients are going to have to experience bed rest. Um, and this is obviously notable, you know, um, even with patients that are undergoing total knee and total hip replacements, they can't be up all day. They need to only be up for a certain amount of time. And that's just due to overall swelling um, and potential risk for obviously um, having to undergo, you know, a revision or so forth if that individual is having overall too much uh, inflammation in the limb. Uh, but bed rest may also be recommended post-fracture um, and various other cases, uh, such as even cardiovascular open-heart surgery. So uh, that bed rest period of time we know is uh, a window of time that more often than not, patients are going to be experiencing muscle atrophy. Uh, they're going to be experiencing loss of overall strength. And then there are also effects of the cardiovascular system. And then you can further down that um, biopsychosocial model into the psychology of the patient and obviously their ability to you know, again, go to work, um, attend to their family. So some of the proposed ways that we should approach, you know, these patient populations is in a step pattern. Um, Lonicky in 2012 had proposed some potential benefits that he saw from some studies at the time that showed uh, men that were cast immobilized or men and women that were post ACL, the application of blood flow restriction during uh, these rest periods using a cell swollen protocol of which MADAP has programmed into their system. Um, does have an ability to help and activate mTOR, um, does have an ability then to um, yeah, potentially do so via uh, norepinephrine routes just due to the overall stress response. And uh, this was shown to have a potential benefit at, again, augmenting the amount of muscle loss and, and the amount of muscle strength seen in these patients, uh, with some significance being shown in some studies, but not all studies. Um, progression from the MAT um, or from a, a resting state into now a more active state was now a, a, a more or less like a phase two proposition here where, hey, we're seeing some studies uh, in mixed men and women in various ages from young all the way to much older, um, showing that the combination of blood flow restriction with things like slow walking, uh, with things like riding a bicycle, um, can provide benefits in a very short order amount of time um, that, and obviously even a short overall frequency, you know, some of these studies showing even just twice a week exposure 
um, having benefits to increase in um, maximal oxygen uptake, uh, so measure VO2, um, changes in overall, uh, obviously muscle size and strength, but as well some improvements um, to carotid arterial compliance, which is seen in some studies and not all. But this is important because we want to understand that in general, slow walking does not have an ability to have any sort of accumulation of metabolites. So although the intensities are quite low when we're walking, some of the potential benefits of these metabolites um, existing within the limb, being detected by the central nervous system, and then having a downstream effect on the cardiovascular system um, provides some of the understanding as to why these patients are seeing, or these subjects are seeing benefit um, with the application of it. And obviously it does make sense to have this in rehabilitation as we all use um, uh, cardiovascular based devices, many of which for pain, but as well, if we can have some additional benefits all the more, especially in these low intensity scenarios. Uh, progression from cardiovascular into some strength training is obviously a very um, logical path to take with patients. And there's been many studies that have been done at this time and more so than even what are presented on just this one page. Again, looking at low intensities with short durations of time, anywhere from um, six weeks uh, to some of them now as long as 12 weeks. Uh, so showing some acute and some chronicity of the effects of it. Um, having benefits in overall, obviously, muscle size and strength, improvements in bone formation markers. And that's really kind of where things get, you know, interesting because we have many patients that may not be able to undergo uh, further um, uh, increased intensity for a duration of time following a fracture um, or um, um, open reduction internal fix fixation or IF um, implants into the skeleton. They may need more time. And, and I, uh, I personally have um, treated many of patients that have undergone overall what we would consider failed rehabilitation um, post ORIF um, that were able to then, uh, with the application of blood flow restriction, have a, a successful um, a rehabilitation uh, with full uh, return back to activity um, and return back to field. In many cases, uh, a lot of the athletes that I treated were professional athletes. Um, but what we do see here is that uh, the general understanding of using um, a higher repetition workload that has been established within the literature now. So uh, most clinical, uh, mo most studies and the studies that I as well have undergone and use a set scheme of four sets of uh, repetitions that range from 30 and then three rounds of 15 reps with about 30 seconds of rest between. And this has shown us to be quite beneficial at, again, um, initiating the microenvironment within muscle um, which helps to, uh, again, start the process of having that um, uh, metabolic communication to the brain, which then can subsequently have then the increase in mechanical tension, even at these low intensities, simply just due to the increase in motor unit recruitment, uh, taking patients many times near failure. And there has been studies that have looked at failure, non-failure, uh, with more or less non-failure being recommended uh, and failure potentially having some benefits in some particular cases. But we can see that at the time of this publication in 2012, of which now there are various other studies um, that show that uh, blood flow restriction can be done in conjunction with a general high intensity training. It can be done either on days that the individual are not exercising or can be done post exercise. And this can be very beneficial as a clinician thinking about the investment of blood flow restriction within their own clinical establishment and as well physicians that are undergoing the thought of referring patients where they can say, you know, I have a patient at all these different phases within the rehab, and I can see now that there is a tool that can aid them at these various different ranges. Uh, uh, well, again, assuming that they are that they're good candidates to, to have this applied to them. Um, but within these studies, you know, within short order, they saw benefits as, as well to again muscle size, muscle strength, um, and in some professional uh, sports environments, increases to things like uh, time to fatigue um, and or peak power. Um, on certain cycle ergometry tests, which can have carryover onto on-field uh, sprint times or one-minute mile times. So let's go into contra contraindications and precautions. We'll go through this quickly. We do know that obviously applying a tourniquet onto an individual's limb is going to have an effect to the overall stroke volume. That means that when we apply a tourniquet, there's a reduction of blood flow returning back to the heart. Obviously that blood volume plays a role with stroke volume and stroke volume consequently plays a role with cardiac output, which is the amount of blood that is ejected from the heart per minute. What we've been able to establish with blood flow restriction is that the heart rate, systolic and diastolic blood pressures 
with blood flow restriction are quite similar in free flow conditions. Cardiac output is not generally highly affected by blood flow restriction exercises uh, with resistance training and uh, in endurance-based training, as well following the prescriptions within the studies which were done with either just bilateral lower limb um, or bilateral upper limb and not done in all four. We do know that removal of the cuff during the rest intervals does mitigate any differences within the BFR and non-BFR groups, um, and that the changes within hemodynamics um, are quite comparable also um, to, uh, uh, to, again, low intensity training, uh, slightly a little bit higher, uh, and as well maybe comparable to high intensity training, but are generally much lower than high intensity training. Um, in, in regards to peripheral vascular response, we do know that BFR can have increases uh, in large artery compliance, which is similar to low intensity and high intensity training with resistance training. We do know that there are some transient improvements to the endothelial function of the actual um, artery, which is why potentially we're seeing some of these improvements in carotid arterial function. We do know that BFR can acutely impair flow mediated dilation um, and, and chronic episodes of flow mediated dilation can have some effects. So this is why we wanna understand that the application with the right tools is necessary. We, we should not be thinking as clinicians to experiment with knee wraps um, or, you know, um, or very narrow thin devices. We, we wanna have an ability to monitor and measure pressures if possible uh, to just improve overall safety. But we do know that um, as well, uh, we'll, we'll kind of quote from the authors here, although the relationship between cardiac output and systemic vascular resistance does not seem to represent a cardiovascular threat in BFR exercise. Um, a steady cardiac output coupled with an increase in systemic vascular resistance could drive an increase in blood pressure and adverse individual response, and it may not be discarded. So we need to understand that although the studies are showing us that it's, it's not generally um, risky to apply BFR, we should still be approaching it you know, with a sense of understanding of more of the complex nature to the cardiovascular system. Um, a lot of questions I have been asked since the start of getting involved with blood flow restrictions, really a majority have stemmed from clot formation. Um, a lot of, I wouldn't say misinformation, but I would just say a lot of um, just healthy amounts of ignorance, I think, towards the use of tourniquets and clot formation have been my experience um, across all professions um, that deal in patient rehabilitation. Um, so it's important that we, uh, you know, put some of those fears to rest and understand that there are no significant increases in coagulation measured by a D-dimer or C-reactive protein um, uh, in utilization of blood flow restriction or in general with tourniquet use. We do know that uh, upon deflation of the tourniquet, there are increases in TPA, which are, are endogenous um, clot-busting enzymes. So we do know that with the use of a tourniquet, um, there's already some potential uh, mechanisms that provide benefit to a patient. Now, yes, given if a tourniquet is applied at very high pressure for long durations of time, it can become um, risky because we are in inducing long durations of venous stasis. But by and large, the short, dur short durations of blood flow restriction do not appear to have that. Um, in particular, there was a study that looked at blood flow restriction uh, with resistance exercise where they simulated an, an 8,000 foot elevation and a six degree head down, down position and saw no significant rises within these um, uh, thromboembolism based um, factors. Um, in another study that looked at uh, clinical ischemic heart disease um, in again, a small group, uh, bilateral lower extremities uh, performing knee extension at a low intensity, uh, saw that when adjusting for uh, plasma volume, there were no statistical elevations within the thrombus um, or within any of the, uh, or, or within C-reactive protein. Now, obviously, we again know that there are some benefits upon deflation of the tourniquet, just based out of the tourniquet research, but it shows us that, you know, four weeks of blood flow restriction uh, with 30% one, uh, one repetition max, so no changes as well, again, in these uh, in, um, uh, clot um, inducing factors, um, two days a week for 12 weeks of blood flow restriction at light intensity training as well, so no, no changes, and this was within older subjects between 61 and 84 years of age. Uh, 12 weeks of bilateral elbow extension. Again, saw no changes within those. Um, and then chronic blood flow restriction post knee surgery, where they looked at 12 sessions within a duration of six weeks. So two sessions per week, saw no significant increases in thrombus formation as well. Now, again, we do know that there are increases in ROS, 
upon deflation of the tourniquet. Um, but within BFR, it showed us that when the application of BFR with exercise applied to it, so a tourniquet, but now with exercise, which is very different than just a tourniquet being put on and taken off, so that there was a significant attenuation of some of these proteins that are associated with the inflammatory cascade that happens with ROS. So this may also provide some potential, potential benefit um, to patients that are undergoing BFR. Now, like we spoke before, muscle damage can be uh, something that is witnessed with blood flow restriction, but they're generally at very low levels and they don't meet significance. So when looking at bilateral knee extension, there are some increases in some, again, inflammatory markers, um, things like interleukin-6, um, uh, um, um, CK, or, or, or specific uh, inflammatory markers that are measured in muscle. And again, we saw there was no significant increases in these, especially even when done at a twice a day model for six days a week, which is a rather high frequency model. Uh, continuous walking uh, with blood flow restriction uh, showed to have as well no increases um, in these muscle uh, inflammatory or muscle damage based markers. Um, and max force, so you know, five sets of knee extension taken to failure did have some overall changes in it that remain that, that showed significant changes in, um, in maximal velocity contraction, um, and which was suppressed for about two days, but returned back to baseline. So again, you know, when we say blood flow restriction should be performed, you know, within a submaximal um, or non-failure state within the clinical setting, it, it's because other studies have shown that yes, when taken to failure, there can be significant, you know, uh, depressed states of muscle contraction. And, you know, there may be some benefit to doing that in some particular phases within that individual's rehab, but by and large, we're generally seeing that most studies are done um, with a lot of safety when we don't take individuals into these uh, failure states. Now, some uh, precautions and contraindications specifically uh, to the application of it, we want to understand that there are some risks associated with it that we should be aware of that should have us consider potentially taking other routes of blood flow restriction. Uh, but these risks are still considered generally um, low, but we should look at the overall accumulation of these, which many older patients may have. And this may you know, warrant them not having blood flow restriction applied. Because again, remember, it is just a tool. So we shouldn't be thinking that all patients should have blood flow restriction applied to them. There, there should be a, a narrow margin at which we're approaching this. And uh, within these risk categories, we should be quite aware of which, um, uh, let, let me go down them. So patients with poor circulation systems, obviously that should be very um, logical in nature because we are applying pressure onto the circulatory system itself. So, you know, individuals that have, um, you know, poor calcium scores, um, individuals that have a history of atherosclerosis, um, you know, we should be aware of this and, uh, and, and consult um, and, and coordinate with their physician or their specialist to see if this is potentially a benefit to them. Um, but it does, again, there are some studies that show some low levels of blood flow restriction may be beneficial for that, for those particular cases. Um, uh, as I go down this, um, I'm going to go right to diabetes because I mentioned all the other ones already in the past statement. So with diabetes, there are some potential um, current studies uh, that are looking at blood flow restriction, maybe having a benefit to this. Uh, remember that even in diabetes type 2 and individuals who are also diabetic type 1, uh, muscle cells do have an insulin independent route of releasing uh, glucose transporter 4 due to a contraction based mechanism. And obviously, blood flow restriction is a contraction based um, uh, clinical intervention. And there can be uh, potential benefits to just the contractions alone helping to improve um, um, glucose transport or the removal of glucose from the circulatory system, which obviously has benefits to reducing overall risk for hypertension and or atherosclerotic inflammation within the vessels, but there may be some other benefits as well due, just due to the me metabolic changes happening in the muscle and as well increases in muscle size um, may potentially have benefits in insulin sensitivity. Um, obviously, hypertension is a risk-based population and that should be taken into consideration that that individual is um, treated and they are medicated um, to uh, you know, consider the use of it with them. Obviously, infection is a risk-based scenario um, and sickle cell trait is. Now, in the contraindications, um, obviously, cancer is one that is being more looked at specifically now, um, obviously, due to cancer cachexia. These are groups that would benefit, by and large, by having the application of a intervention that could increase overall um, muscle health, because obviously, they are undergoing a muscle-wasting-based experience, 
due to either, either cancer treatment or the metastasis of the cancer itself. So um, that is an area that is uh, undergoing research right now. Um, obviously, extremities with dialysis support or open wounds, those should logically make sense as a clinician that you are not going to be applying a tourniquet onto those areas as you can undergo further damage and injury to that individual. All right, uh, moving on, we want to think in the clinical setting, uh, blood flow restriction um, should really be applied uh, with a, well, obviously here in the United States, a FDA a class one medical device. This means that the device is able to fully or partition or full or partial occlusion of blood flow. Um, and it is then in the medical setting and it should be applied by a medical device itself. So obviously the MADAP unit um, is a FDA listed device here in the United States. And it is able to occlude uh, fully or partially arterial blood flow um, and venous blood flow. Um, and obviously it does meet the criteria based on the former research uh, for obviously um, cuff uh, design, uh, monitoring of the system, cuff material. So when we think about why we need to be doing these, again, the previous literature shows us that individual limb characteristics um, and individual um, uh, cardiovascular uh, characteristics of that individual should be taken into consideration. And that's why assessment is critical. We shouldn't just be applying uh, these tourniquets without having an assessment on the front end of it um, uh, because obviously it does increase risk for that individual having more pressure than is necessary. And that can, you know, have either non-detrimental effects on the individual, because we know it's quite safe to, you know, perform blood flow restriction, but it can lead to, you know, a, uh, just a reduction in compliance um, with the tool, uh, because obviously it can create pain, you can create bruising, uh, you can create intermittent redness in the skin, um, and, you know, in, in situations where it is not being monitored correctly, um, you can induce things like syncope, um, or obviously, you know, if an individual is really not paying attention to what they're doing, um, there's no, uh, the patient hasn't been educated how to re reduce the pressure or the device itself does not have an, a, a means of automatically deflating, then there, yes, there can be subsequent risks that follow with that. So we want to use the correct tools within the correct setting. Now, uh, I mentioned before that we were going to be discussing some of the guidelines that have been proposed by, uh, by and large, some of the, the, the brightest minds within uh, the field of, of, of blood flow restriction. So again, this is taken from that Patterson et al. 2019 publication uh, that did follow um, the acceptance of blood flow restriction as a uh, APTA um, um, uh, physical therapy um, uh, tool. So we, we want to understand here that the guidelines for individuals that are unable to undergo exercise uh, where we're using um, uh, the, the, the unit in a more of a passive scenario. Um, and yes, it can be applied with neuromuscular re-education to gain some additional benefits, can have a frequency of about one to two times per day. Um, they can have a restriction time of about five minutes. Um, th there's typically anywhere from three to five sets that are performed. Um, obviously, uh, the guidelines do provide information about cuff widths, um, pressures. Obviously, it, it should be based on the arterial occlusion pressure. That's what AOP means, which means it should be about 70 to 100% of that individual's pressure. And the good thing about, obviously, devices like the MADAP unit are that this guideline is already pre-programmed into the unit underneath the rehabilitation setting, um, where you just basically go to the setting. Um, set up your patient, hit start, and the unit itself will now um, prompt the individual and prompt the clinician um, with the sets that are being performed. Um, the endurance, uh, again, guideline, as we see here now, as, as most current as can be, it could be about two to three times a week. Um, it can be a little bit greater than, than three times a week. I myself have had um, many patients that are um, either professional athletes, um, um, or um, are individuals that are, um, you know, seeking, let's say, a, uh, a fitness-based examination with either law enforcement, military, um, and or have to, you know, have some sort of uh, fitness performance test done, have them do it more often. It can also be performed one or two times per day or one or three, again, times per week. These generally are at intensities that are less than 50% of the VO2 max or heart rate reserve. And these things can be very easily calculated within a clinic. Uh, these can be as short as five to 20 minutes per exercise, which really meet, again, the criteria for what we generally are going to be doing within a clinic setting, especially if we are more of a unit-based uh, clinic uh, setting, where obviously undergoing units are important, not just for obviously the benefit of the patient, but obviously the benefit of the practice itself. Um, 
These are done in continuous pressures or within intervals, like you saw within previous uh, studies. If there's a real risk for that individual um, having um, large stress being placed on their cardiovascular system, you can deflate during rest periods. And again, units like the MATIC allow you to actually have and program those rest settings so that you can have this more specifically fine-tuned for the patient. And lastly, obviously, we do know that the strength settings uh, when undergoing this or hypertrophy-based settings are about two to three times a week or one to two times per day because there's low levels of muscle damage that are done, which the authors of various different research studies have shown us can allow us to have higher levels of frequency um, if that is obviously the, pro the proposed use of it. And we've seen this in healthies. I've done this with many bodybuilders, professional and amateurs um, that have undergone, you know, uh, considerable change in short periods of time. Uh, again, with loads as low as 20 to 40 percent of a 1RM, restriction times are about five to 10 minutes. And again, this can be done either in a continuous or an intermittent setting. And again, units like the MATIC unit allow you to program that in there. Um, and as well, uh, uh, the guidelines provide you this can be done, you know, in a 30, 15, 15, 15 block setting, or they can be done with sets taken to failure. I've experimented with both of those. Um, with, with real human subjects um, and as well within just overall patient populations and can say each of those have benefits depending upon how you want to carve out that plan of care or that overall training block for that individual. Rest periods are generally 30 to 60 seconds um, and there's, there is some tempo involved in here. A one to two second concentric eccentric tempo are important and again the cool thing is that a unit like MADAP does allow you to program in the concentric eccentric periods uh, with using things like biofeedback uh, beeps so that that individual kind of be watching the monitor um, and seeing the actual concentric eccentric uh, bouts that you should be performing in, or simply can be just be using the overall um, auditory cue to undergo either of those um, uh, specific portions of the lift. So I think I've ended right on time, guys. It is 11 a.m. Uh, thank you uh, for obviously participating within uh, the overall presentation. Um, I am going to allow now. Um, uh, guys told me we're, we're going to put about 10 minutes on the clock for some questions to be asked. So if you'd uh, obviously in an orderly fashion um, can either uh, unmute yourself to ask some questions or kind of take them like that. So start my 10 minutes on the clock. If anybody's got any questions, uh, go ahead, Guy, I'll let you manage this end of it. I'll just yes. be on the back end. So, so for me, the best would be to, uh, to ask the question in the chat and then we're just going to read the question and, uh, and then be able to answer. Probably better. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to the chat. He seems nervous. Is this an infomercial for Matt up? I don't know about nervous. I, I think pressed for time. <laughs> I've uh, definitely presented um, uh, to many individuals of, of various different levels uh, within uh, the medical profession. So nervous was not one of the things I was experiencing today. Just more pressed for time, making sure that we can get this um, uh, to everybody within the hour block. I know people have patients to see um, and or other things to do. So, but again, uh, 10 minutes from the clock, if there's any questions you individuals wanna ask, you know, go ahead and pose them in there. Sometimes no questions mean I hit enough things. So I'll also yeah. think that as a positive. <laughs> oh, of which if, uh, if anybody's still seeing my screen share, um, uh, once we think about making um, this public, there is an entire reference list that is present. Um, so uh, feel free to go down the rabbit hole. Um, you know, with these studies, um, there's a large amount of available information that just continues to be published every day um, because blood pressure restriction is quite a hot topic. Okay, so I do see a question here. Will this presentation be available? Um, like, like we said before, uh, we're, we're going to see about what we can do with that to make that happen. Um, it is a great presentation because it is only about an hour long now to be able to apply um, to, you know, a physician who maybe refers patients to you or to a practice manager um, or clinical director who's maybe considering um, you know, further undergoing um, education for uh, blood flow restriction or certification, or obviously just, you know, picking up a unit if they've already been certified. All right, still waiting here. Yes, waiting for the question. Oh, 
Okay, can you explain if the risk, so I see one here from Ken Moore, can you explain if the risk slash classifications have weights and what number of accumulation of them would be totally rule out the use of EFR? So Ken, there have been um, some proposed um, weighted metrics towards it. They weren't validated and, and they, nobody really ever followed up with them. Um, I myself during some early um, certification presentations did present on a numerical scale um, that looked at the accumulation of comorbidities, really starting first with blood pressure, uh, the overall weight of the individual, so their BMI, uh, male versus female. Um, so what we basically saw was that, you know, um, men over women with higher blood pressure with comorbidities, uh, such as also diabetes, um, peripheral arterial disease, um, are at quite high risk to perform blood flow restriction. The older you get, the higher the risk criteria does go. Women, it seems to be similar with age, BMI, and blood pressure, but uh, there were some proposed um, cutoff points with things like pregnancy, uh, because obviously, you know, women who are pregnant should still undergo physical activity, um, and because they will have a necessary need to reduce their weight during their kind of like mid to late second trimester, definitely within their third trimester with even augmenting body positions, um, there, there was some proposed um, cutoff points for them, but it, it never fully underwent additional validation with it because it, it, there's just so many different things to try to cover. So I think right now what we're seeing is the majority of the studies are looking at um, individual um, uh, clinic-based uh, populations, so cardiovascular disease, rheumatoid arthritis, um, uh, Parkinson's disease, um, uh, cancer, um, diabetes. So each of these are kind of getting their individual um, uh, you know, approaches first before I think something like that can really be proposed in a, in a, in a generalized manner. Um, is there any studies on young adolescents? Um, so from my best understanding, uh, there are some that do go into, the, into kind of the teenage population. Um, and these are things like with knee injuries, ankle base injuries. Um, and, uh, you know, basically, you know, we're kind of seeing the same thing we would see, you know, um, in, in older individuals. Uh, we want to consider that a, a young person's um, body, their hemodynamics are obviously much healthier, considering they are healthy. So I think if, if, if we were to think about, hey, applying a tourniquet onto one of them, you kind of really got to think about like, what does the tourniquet got to look like? Because tourniquets applied in adolescent populations are very different than adult tourniquets. They're, the widths, the lengths are different. So it has to match the patient. You can't just take a, an adult cuff and put it on a kid and, and you know, call it a day. The likelihood is there is risks associated with that. So there does need to be some individual characteristics to the application of the, of the device itself um, um, within the adolescent population. Okay, so I see no more open questions. We're down to four minutes, guys. Participants, nice. There's still 24 of you in here. So if you've got some questions, you know, feel free to just ask them. Now's the time um, while, you know, while we're on the call. Anything that pops up to mind, any random question, remember there is no bad question, right? Uh, I think right now we're just at a point within the research that we are um, really starting to get deeper into the physiology. And, and again, I, I invite so many physical therapists to just crack open, you know, your book again into uh, neuromuscular response with exercise, cardiovascular response with exercise. It's important that you, um, you know, understand how robust the human body is um, towards levels, you know, high levels of blood pressure, um, how robust our, our, our nervous system is um, but also what are the effects of, of injury and deconditioning and pain more specifically, you know, to our cardiovascular system, you know, can, can pain induce hypertension? Yes, we can see that now. Um, can it do it chronically? Yes. The prevalence rates are much higher. Um, can pain um, induce changes within neuromuscular recruitment patterns? Yes, it can. It shows that it is not simply just a nociceptive route, but it is also a central motor route. Um, so for more actual um, thoughts, we can change how, you know, the orderly fashion of muscle recruitment and understanding these things really helps to solidify why we should use blood flow restriction as a tool when the patient meets that particular need. 
because obviously um, it, it, it can be done in a way of helping to restore normal electrical conductivity or cardiovascular function. Okay, I see another question here. What are typical CPT or billing codes that are utilized in conjunction with vehicle training? So good question. Obviously, I take it you're from the US. Um, so typical CPT codes for BFR um, are, it, it is done in conjunction with therapeutic exercise and therapeutic activity. Um, I myself, even when doing it with things like neuromuscular reeducation, which could be something like, um, you know, um, unattended stim, I'll still build that in, under like a TA, uh, TE, um, or even neuromuscular reeducation more specifically, uh, would be one that I would apply it with, um, some, um, billing software allows you to do it. I know currently I'm using therapy source at the clinic where I'm at now. And um, there's a whole entire drop down box for blood flow restriction training that allows you to put in, you know, what was your occlusion pressure? How long did you do it? You know, was this continuous intermittent? Um, what'd you apply it with? And then what do you want to bill it? And the billing options are TETA or, or neuromuscular rea. Um, and, and obviously that way you're billing a standard unit for it. So say for example, if I have a patient who's post-op and they come in and I'm going to be applying, you know, a passive route with it, um, or maybe, or I want them doing, you know, quad sets with it. I've got my matic device. I program, you know, my rehabilitation setting. It does everything else for me on the billing side. I put that underneath, you know, um, I might do neuromuscular reeducation, um, you know, isometric quadricep contractions with BFR. Um, if I've got them doing cardiovascular on a bike, on a treadmill, similar, I'm going to build that for, you know, TE or TA depending upon if it's, you know, if I, it's just, you know, TETA is kind of like up to the clinician. Some people think it's before activity, after activity, preparation for activity. You know, I think it really depends on, on, on kind of what your billing style is. Um, and obviously, you know, your, your ability to defend it, you know, uh, litigiously if you have to. Um, and then obviously, you know, for general strength and conditioning uh, based exercises, open chain, closed chain, um, uh, isotonic, bilateral, um, uh, those are the same thing. I'll be building them underneath those same particular coding uh, references. As it goes outside of the U.S., um, I've heard many people, um, you know, apply billing for it in the same way. So there's there's really no, no no change with that. Maybe there will be a CPT code down the road. I would assume that what that would do for the profession is that it would increase the amount of BFR education within most um, BFR institutions uh, that that are obviously accredited. And because that's the same reason why we saw things like dry needling get taught in DPT programs, why we see manual therapy get taught in DPT programs. It's because there's a monetization system behind it that implores practice owners to have their clinicians get certification with it because it obviously opens up further means of, you know, financial um, sustainability for that practice to do so. So you know, I, I know that's why a lot of pe people in BFR are so kind of like iffy to pull the trigger on getting certified and, and applying it um, because they're like, ah, I don't know how, if I, uh, am I going to get more money out of it? And I'll tell you, it really just depends on how you are working with your physicians, how you're working with your uh, direct access patients and how you're building out that practice. Um, and um yeah, so there definitely are ways that you can do that. And it's still very much in its infancy here in the United States. I, I, I'd say there's there's still a lot of room for BFR to grow here. And, 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 it, and it, it needs things like this. It just needs good education for people to understand, hey, this is safe, this is effective. Um, and you know, now, now what are the tools that I can use to do it? Uh, do I want tools that are gonna be more standardized? Do I want tools that are gonna be uh, able to monitor systems? It, you know, I, I can tell you right now the safety side, um, there, there's not huge differences between those, but again, it does boil down to how it is you want to undergo your treatment plan with that patient and what kind of setting are you trying to provide, you know, for that patient and for the physicians that are referring there. That was a long-winded response. Okay, guys, well, we're, we're, we're now 12 minutes past the hour. I still see that there's 21 participants. I guess you're, you're, you're eager to hear something from me, so I'll, I'll give you two minutes to ask the last question, and then uh, and then I I do have to get going.
Okay, participants are dropping off now. All right, well, yeah. yeah. Well, hey, Guy, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you very much, uh, Mario. And um, and then we appreciate and uh, to respond to some of the questions, I will manage to be able to uh, to have recorded the um, the webinar. So we will see what we can do for the ones that that missed it, and uh, we will organize another webinar on the way you apply blood function training in uh, in your practice. So for people to project themselves in the way to use it and how to use it in a process of rehabilitation or maybe ACL or different pathology. So yeah. we hope that will be the, the, next, uh, the next webinar. Thank you, for everybody, for turning up. And uh, thank you again, uh, Mario, and we speak uh, to you soon. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye, bye, bye.